what I want to start with is painting a context. We talked about resilience, and I want to go a little bit more in depth in, in terms of what resilience really means. And in terms of the relationship between sustainability and, and resilience, this is kind of my graphic uh, that I think about. We, we've heard of sustainability as this larger umbrella that a lot of things fall under. And when I think about the relationship between sustainability and resilience, I see resilience as the handle. It's the foundation upon which sustainability needs to be built. So when I talk about resilience, and I give you examples of kind of how we're operationalizing that, almost all of them are in the context of broader sustainability initiatives. Now, we, can, we should probably dialogue about this inside meetings, because there are some nuances here. But nonetheless, this is kind of sticking with the theme of the session, the way that I think about these terms. So, when we want to talk about resilience, we generally ask two starting questions. The first is resilience of what? What is it that we're concerned about? So there are different systems that we can think about. That could be the economy, the world's economy that perhaps we're uh, interested in. It could be an ecosystem. It could be a city. It could be our energy supply. It could be an individual. It could be a neighborhood. There's lots of different systems. But generally, we start thinking about resilience of what? What are we questioning? The second, then, is resilient to what? And we've heard a lot of discussion about needing to be resilient to lots of different issues, particularly those we don't even know about. But generally, in our conversation right now, we're asking, what is it that we're concerned about? So that could be uh, resilience to economic collapse, certainly something we're thinking about, resilience to a natural disaster, uh, perhaps to psychological or emotional distress. And then for us, resilience to climate change is certainly what we're here mostly to talk about. It can also be, again, resilient to all of these things or different things that we haven't kind of talked about. Then there's this tricky part of defining resilience. There are literally dozens of definitions that attempt to get at what resilience is. So taking kind of a pause and looking at the <laughs> theoretical literature, here are two examples of definitions. The first is from the engineering field, and the second is from the ecological field. And if you, again, we're not going to go into this in too much detail, but you can take a look at these later. I will point out the engineering definition is the historical bouncing back. It's returning to a state pre-disaster. The ecological definition focuses much more on this idea of maintaining function, maintaining structure. So that could mean evolving to a new state, but it's, again, maintaining that core purpose of the system. This is a little confusing, but it's not just academia where this is confusing. I took uh, some time over the last few weeks to look at almost all of your climate or sustainability plans for the cities that we have. And almost every single one of you mentions the need to be resilient to something. It may be uh, resilient natural systems. You want resilient water supplies. Only one of your plans defines resilience, and that's New York City. And this is the definition that New York gives to resilience. And this is actually, sorry to be in your way, Andy, somewhat different than the other definitions that we've seen. So what does this tell me? This is a confusing landscape. We don't really know what resilience is. And I'm going to argue that's OK, that we don't need to be caught up in the definition of resilience. Instead, uh, well, actually, let me pause. Let me give you this little landscape. These are some of the different things. If we literally spent time looking at the various definitions, people define them, again, this idea of bouncing back. The problem is bouncing back may mean that you're ill-prepared for the future, right? So bouncing back itself isn't perhaps the right definition. We just heard bouncing forward. That's something we talk about. Um, there is some dialogue around evolution or evolving to a new state. Scientists like Dr. Ricky Rood argue that there is no new state because climate change will continually change the state. So you evolve to a new state, and then you have to evolve to a new state, and then you evolve to a new state. So that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Then there's this idea of absorbing shocks and stressors. And then we've got this function, maintaining function, sort of state purpose. Um, Andy. Uh, Andrew, sorry, gave us this idea in his book about purpose and integrity. So it's kind of a subset of this idea of resilience. Suffice it to say, this is, this is kind of a messy space. And there are lots of reasons why this is messy. Uh, di different disciplines think about resilience in different ways. Uh, the way we operationalize it is different. Again, I don't think this is as critically important. So a number of us uh, that are thinking about resilience, instead of focusing on the definition, are trying to think about what are the characteristics of resilience, in particular within the urban setting? Many of the people in this room are doing this work. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the things that they're thinking about. This is a beginning list. There is no consensus about these different characteristics. But I will note their outcome characteristics 
and very importantly, their process characteristics as well. And the third from the bottom, which should be the bottom, are this idea, um, there's not consistency about robustness and redundancy and the role that they play. They're important in some systems, but are they really true characteristics of resilience? We don't know. We do know that diversity is good. We know that adaptive capacity um, is a term that we've talked about a bit. That could be uh, access to resources, that could be wealth, that could be social networks and cohesion. But in enhancing these things, these different characteristics, we think will help communities enhance resilience to a lot of different perturbations. With that said, I want to take uh, the rest of the time to talk about how we're moving from these kind of theoretical constructs to what's happening on the ground. So I mostly looked at your plans, those of you in the room, uh, and then pulled some from the other literature. I didn't have time to look at everyone's, so confession, I went alpha order from bios. Sorry, those of you who have last names uh, later in the alphabet. Uh, so looking at Baltimore and Riverside on this slide, we see um, the example I pulled from Baltimore from their plan is about urban ag. It's about local food production. This is about uh, modularity. This is about diversifying the energy, or I'm sorry, the food system within the community. This is about engagement and sort of empowerment. We've got uh, Riverside looking at energy efficiency, uh, looking at renewable energy, land use principles uh, played a pretty big role in this plan. Again, the same general characteristics I talked about uh, for Baltimore kind of manifesting themselves here. One of the things you'll see, neither of these plans are about adaptation. Neither of these plans are about resilience at their core. These are just co-benefits that they get from really smart actions that they're taking to increase their, the sustainability of these communities. That's an important component, uh, certainly, is the integration and the co-benefits that we get from these strategies. Some more examples looking at Bedford, New York, uh, New York and Philadelphia and Dayton. All of these are land use strategies, uh, mostly focusing on increasing wetlands, urban forestry, uh, looking at using drought resistant uh, crops, um, I'm sorry, grasses. So again, this is this idea of diversifying, uh, increasing modularity again. Really great work, some very interesting stories. And if you haven't looked, uh, these are really impressive things. I mean, they're quantifying the amount of value they're getting from things like reducing the urban heat island effect, reducing stormwater runoff into the system, um, increasing home prices because of urban forestry and what that's actually doing to the local uh, community. So a lot of really great, again, co-benefits coming from these strategies. There's an entire suite of things that we know that are happening now to address existing stressors that are taking place within our communities. And this is logical. The challenge is we need to make sure we're addressing today's stressors as well as tomorrow's stressors. So we're building in flexibility into our systems. So again, kind of a little list here of some of the things happening ranging from uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, updating the zoning code because basements are flooding. So maybe there will be no new basement apartments within the city because that's just a vulnerability that they're not willing on accepting. Um, Keene, New Hampshire, one of the first communities to kind of look at adaptation and resilience, simply increasing the culvert size because they knew that their existing culverts couldn't handle the storm water that was coming through the system. These are logical things that they're doing now to address vulnerabilities, but they're helping increase the resilience of these communities. I could not talk about uh, resilience without talking about this growing movement to collaborate regionally. So we've got uh, three examples, and they're all represented in this room. So please talk to your colleagues. We've got uh, the Southeast Florida Climate Compact, uh, the Western Adaptation Alliance, and then the San Diego Regional Collaborative, which are bringing multiple municipalities together to talk about regional issues, to share data, to share best practices, and very importantly, to share what didn't work. We're not very good at doing that as a society, and we need to become better as we're looking to increase our resilience and advance sustainability. This is also uh, about political cover. When you're working as a region, it is a lot easier to talk to a mayor and say, well, so-and-so is also doing this. This is really important. And a lot of the vulnerabilities that we face don't stop at our municipal borders. They're multi-municipality, they're regional. So this, these kinds of initiatives are gaining a lot of traction and momentum, and uh, I just want to say great job, those of you doing them. Uh, the last thing I was asked to talk about were sort of some boundary organizations that are helping support municipal efforts in this space. So I picked three, and apologies for those of you in the room I did not grab. The first we just heard about, which is CARI, which is the Community uh, and Regional Resilience Institute. They've created something called the CRS, 
or uh, the Community Resilience System. This was created with about 150 different stakeholders working together to think about what resilience meant to all kinds of stressors. So this is not just climate change, this is terrorism, this is economic collapse across the board. Uh, it's both process and outcome-based. There's an online tool, there's guidance materials and sort of how you think about resilience and how you institutionalize it. It starts by helping a community create a vision for what they'll look like when they're resilient and then works with them to identify strategies to effectively achieve that vision. It's being tested right now in seven communities and uh, in the notes, if you get this slide, you can see those seven communities. The next one is ICLEI. Uh, ICLEI is here, so you can talk to them. They have a program explicitly focused on climate resilience. It's the Climate Resilient Communities Program. It's a process-based program. Uh, with it comes technical guidance, case studies, networking, uh, collaboration, et cetera. So it's a little bit more uh, robust. They also have a tool uh, that's meant to technically guide communities through this process of looking at uh, their vulnerabilities, strategies to increase resilience, et cetera. Um, and for me, at least, CARI is critical because it's thinking about resilience across all different systems. ICLEI's been really important in the adaptation and resilience space for really making it, I would say, safe for communities to start thinking about adaptation. Even six or seven years ago, we weren't really allowed to have a conversation about adaptation in this country that was considered defeat. And so coming out, I think ICLEI was really a vanguard in that space. Uh, a lot of work to be done today to really scale up and continue being uh, at the forefront, but there are some really interesting things here. And then I certainly have to talk about the RESAs, which are the Regional Integrated Science and Assessments. These are NOAA-funded initiatives. Uh, they are uh, dispersed. You can see the map. They're not everywhere within the US. And if you have a RESA in your region, you really should be collaborating with them. They are tasked with creating useful, usable uh, data for stakeholders. They're focused on looking at climate variability and change and the kinds of impacts and the actions you could take to address those impacts. Um, the most, to me at least, the most important thing about the RESAs is that they're attempting to break down the one-way information flow that we have, which is scientists traditionally create what they think is good science, they put it out there and say, why aren't the stakeholders using this? This is great information. We're really smart. It doesn't really work all the time. This is meant to be a two-way conversation in which information is co-produced. You're really talking and understanding the kinds of things that stakeholders need and then producing, again, that information that's understandable, useful, and usable. This is a model that a lot of people are watching and trying to replicate. Um, and we do have people from the RESAs in the room here too. So just in closing, some final thoughts. Uh, this is the space that I work in, in particular thinking about the characteristics of resilience and how we understand those characteristics across different stressors, whether that's climate change or specifically drought or flooding or whether that's economic collapse. And are they really relevant for these different uh, stressors that you experience? And the kinds of things that have become really clear in looking at experiences on the ground. Uh, the first is a hypothesis. And I'll thank Brendan for helping me test this hypothesis, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, we're kind of doing this little project now. And that is, Resilience, whether or not the definition is clear, as a society, we think about it as a very positive thing. We want to be resilient. So uh, I hypothesize that when we are more positive in our framing, when we paint a vision of a resilient community, we bring more non-traditional stakeholders into that dialogue, and I think we probably engage them for longer periods of time than we would if we talked about more traditional things like vulnerability and how you're at risk. So we're testing this in real time, but again, I, I think this is probably true. The second, the definition of the term, this is my radical statement, I don't think it matters. Uh, frankly, I'm tired of talking about the definition of resilience. Uh, please don't tell my professors this. Uh, nonetheless, what I think really matters is how we operationalize that term. What does it look like on the ground? How do we create resilient places? And defining that in terms of our local context is so much more significant to me. And then the third, climate change is but one of many stressors, and Robin Lachenko very eloquently points, uh, points this out in much of her writing. A, a resilient system is one that can tolerate lots of different stressors, but climate change isn't the only stressor that's driving our work, right? We're dealing with economic issues, lack of capacity, lack of resources. We need to increase the resilience of our system to all of these different perturbations, and that's critically important. So I'm going to tie it back to our keynote. 
Uh, I read this on the plane. My husband bought me uh, Andrew's book for Christmas, and I have been holding it, and I didn't read it. And then I looked at the agenda and was like, crap. So I frantically started to read it. And uh, on the plane, I came across this quote, and I just thought, that's, that's it. That's it right there. So resilience is, like life itself, messy, imperfect, and inefficient, but it survives. So with that, um, I will say, I do have slides on the national assessment later, and so if anyone wants to talk about them, happy to share with you our key findings from the assessment. Um, but for now, thank you.